I have learned to say, well, it's not making sense now, mm. but I know that there is something else there's in the bigger picture. And I don't know what that bigger picture is mm. then. But I think as I sit in parliament now and as I stand there, I look back and I'm thinking, now I know where I was meant to go. Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. And today I have a special guest, my best friend, Dai Lee, and the federal MP, who is the first Vietnamese federal MP of Australia. And so I feel privileged to be in her office right now. She's based in Cabra Matter and I just popped in and I wanted to kind of deep dive into life as an MP <laughs> and for you to also get to know a little bit about her journey. I, I feel like the journey of courage is like when I talk to you, you've gone through so much. So take us through a little bit about, you know, your starting out as a refugee and then uh, yeah, where you are now in the last few years. Oh gosh, that is kind of condensing. Yeah, make it short. Make it short. Make me condensing through the four decades of life into um, in uh, how, however long this is going to be, you know, I left uh, Vietnam or escaped Vietnam back in those days before you were even born, mm -hmm. I'm sure. There was a war there and and at the time, you know, my my family escaped due, because of communism. And so we ended up, you know, we went on a boat on the, on the sea and nearly died mm -hmm. yeah. and then ended up in refugee camps in uh, Southeast Asia and then spending a few years in those camps before we were accepted for ref refugee resettlement here in Australia. So that was around 79. And back in those days, the uh, refugee settlement from Vietnam was very small. In yeah. 79, we were some of the f f handful of families who resettled here. And we uh, couldn't speak English. My mum was a single mum mm. uh, with three daughters. Obviously, reflecting back now, you know, she was obviously very challenged by the country, by the culture, mm. and being a single mother as well mm. here in this foreign land must have been very, very challenging for her. And, and yeah, so we went to school and, uh, you know, I grew up here in Cabramatta, finished my HSC or the high school education, as they're called. Uh, and then I ended up becoming a journalist back in 1990, I think, 1991, as a journalist for the Liverpool Champion, which is a local newspaper. Mm out here and then set in and then I later on set up help set up the Fairfield Champion which is Camping Matter is part of Fairfield rather than Liverpool. So I worked there as a journalist and then I ended up um, after a few years there I was the first Vietnamese or ethnic as they call it mm -hmm. ethnic uh, reporter back then and then I ended up going into the Australian Broadcasting Corporation. Started very low. <laughs> Started as a researcher. I, I, I wanted to do anything. I just thought Whatever task that were given to me, whatever menial task it was, I was prepared to do because my aim was obviously to build on my skill as a communicator, really? as a writer, as a reporter. And so I, you know, got a job back in those days. It was, you know, it was challenging for a person of non-English speaking background mm -hmm. to get into mainstream media, but I managed to get in there as a uh, researcher. So I helped, I worked at the ABC researching for programs, mm. you know, so that was a very, and that was a bottom end job. Mm. And I spent almost nearly two decades at the ABC, the Australian Broadcasting Corporation. Now, probably I was the first ever non-white person to really get a role eventually as a reporter. Mm. Not on TV though, back then they still weren't for me, did not have diverse faces mm. on the screen. Uh, but radio was where I really, you know, nurture my craft and mm. storyteller. Uh, and then during that time, I also took time out of my full time job to go and make television documentaries. So it's all my life was about communicating. Mm. I love communicating, and I think that telling people stories is engaging with them. Um, our diverse community here in Southwest Sydney and trying to get those stories and sharing those stories with the rest of the country, mm. Australia wide. And uh, so, yeah, so that's what I did. And it was challenging too, because at the time I was the only non-white face mm. in the, what you call it, in the media sphere. We're seeing a bit more diversity yeah. today in 2023. But I can assure you back in the 90s till about even early 2000, there were hardly any mm. So, you know, we have come a, a long way, not as diverse as, say, in countries like the UK or the United States, mm -hmm. 
but Australia is just, you know, we're always kind of five to ten years behind yeah. many things. Anyway, that said, it was a very, we're, we're, we are very privileged to have been settled in Australia. It's a, mm. you know, it's a big country, it's a country with a cleaner environment. And um, yeah, and so, yeah, that's, that's, so that was my journey mm. from being a refugee to trying to build a career in journalism. And then, yeah, in 2008, step into politics. I know. And it took you a long time before you became a federal MP. Like, what was, so that's 15 years in the making. Yeah, yeah. So I had no aspirations, aspiration at all to become a member of parliament. My drive was around storytelling. I love stories. I loved connecting people. And that was what drove me is to get, especially stories from refugees, stories from migrants, because I wanted to ask, find out how was it for them to settle into a new country like Australia? What were the challenges and how did they overcome those challenges? So that was my, obviously, because of my similar experience, that was, I was, I was looking mm. for those stories. So looking back now, like all that hard work, would you have done it again? Knowing this big journey and the feeling that you've got in creating this pride movement, you know, like we're also proud because you represent us Vietnamese and also the people in the West and it's like, I know when I, I was your friend during the journey of hardship, but now you've gone the other side and yeah. like, yeah. was it all worth it? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I think what's worth it is that, you know, even like I, I've been in parliament sitting this whole week and I'm sitting in the house and uh, it's called the house of the chamber and you think, oh my God, I cannot believe it. I'm yeah. sitting here. Yeah. Even though it's arrived, if it's 12 months on, mm -hmm. I'm still thinking, I can't believe it. I'm here mm. and I'm making it's so we're known as the legislators. So we make laws, mm. right? We make policy. You can make an influence in yeah. everyone's life. So, yeah. so yeah. you sit there and you vote on a piece of legislation that will impact somebody like you, mm. be it through your energy uh, bills, or be it through taxes or yeah. taxes, or through your small business, uh, through your roads that you travel, the public transport, through airports. So it's just you know, surreal in that sense. Um, somebody said, oh, you know, n not recently, but in the beginning, because oh, I keep on feeling surreal. That's not good because you should now face the fact that you're here. But surreal for me. I that, think it comes down to feeling really grateful. Yeah. yeah. So I'm, I, it's not so surreal. Like, oh, I can't believe I'm here. But I'm so humbled. Mm -hmm. I, I'm sitting in that, that parliament. It's an Australian parliament representing this community. And in particular, a community that's predominantly migrants and refugees and predominantly mm. Vietnamese background. So, so it's such a humbling experience and it's so rewarding because I'm in there constantly championing and advocating for this community, mm. which I know that, you know, even colleagues on the opposite side have come up to me and said, we sit there and listen to you and you keep on talking so much about your residents and we we inspired we want to do that hash it yeah and because when you're part of a party you can't stand up and criticize a piece of policy you can only stand and support no matter whether or not you agree with the policy or not mm -hmm. whereas where i stand where i am i can stand up and either say congratulations or say that policy is not good enough right for my community so that's the privilege of being in that position. So yeah, I still to this day, and I don't think I will ever feel ungrateful and I will not take it for granted mm. because I think who I am, where I came from. I mean, <laughs> got emotional. Okay. Are you thinking about your refugee time? My mum. Yeah, no, I'm not refugee. You recently lost her mum. Yeah, I think. Uh, four weeks ago. So yeah, so you think that where you come from, you just, you don't forget where you come from. Mm, mm, mm. Um, need to have you go for a moment. Yeah, because thinking back, I think even though you didn't have a clear dream that you're going to be in parliament, no. your true dream was making a difference in people's lives. Yeah. And kind of wanting to rescue or because you've been in the shoes of the people who were in, in we didn't have anything back then. Yeah, exactly. Hard. You've been in the shoes where you didn't have anything. You've been in the shoes where you have, you couldn't speak English. You've been in the shoes where you try to navigate through the system. You've been in the shoes where you get rejected or you get looked down upon and you're where you been treated as being different. Mm. So I've been on all of those, you know, levels. You know. Yeah. And I'm, I too, you know, when I'm going for a run or something, it still hits me to like knowing that I have the freedom that I've always wanted to be able to work from home and then creating jobs from home. And it's, yeah, you're just like, oh my God, because you know what it was like when you're just dreaming. It just yeah. feels so hard and the hustle. 
and yeah. you just never really know when you're going to arrive, right? Yeah. So it would, I would say, what, it took you 30, 40 years from the time you were arriving starting to work yeah. till you're 50 something. Yeah. Such yeah. a long time. Yeah. And the question is, the re result is amazing. It, it's really rewarding, but are you willing to do it? But when you, if you do, it's really great, isn't it? Yeah, like, yeah. I think the, it's, I think, are you willing to, and I love uh, Steve Jobs, one of his uh, lines is that, do not try and connect the dots now. You can only connect the dot at the end, back. looking back. I haven't even gone far yet to look back, but where I am at the moment, I can actually look back and connect some of those dots. Mm. Some of those moments where it's so challenging and, and you think, what was why was that happening? Mm. What is the purpose of that? Mm. And you couldn't mm. figure out what. But I know in the last decade, when everything, every time life throws a curveball at me, I have learned to say, well, it's not making sense now, mm. but I know that there is something else there's in the bigger picture. And I don't know what that bigger picture is mm. then. But I think as I sit in parliament now and as I stand there, I look back and I'm thinking, now I know where I was meant to go, but not then, you know, not in the last, I, I did not know. Mm. You just did not know. And some people are so lucky because they do know what they want to do. Mm. They do know where they're heading. They do have a plan, right? But for me, I did not. I, all I knew was that once I discovered my love for storytelling, I knew what I wanted to yeah. do then. But then beyond that, I had no idea mm. what life has, you know, what my destiny was yeah. supposed to be, uh, what God had in store. But I think that's really important because ultimately we don't have, we don't know the vehicle to get there, but we know deep down the the, the heart, the, the feeling of giving back or, yeah. or making our life better yeah. or making life better for others. But what I think has made, you know, both of us stick through it and persist yeah. is we just also uh, just take the next right step. Yeah. Yeah. And then sometimes, the and if you know all the steps and how hard it is, maybe you will never take it. Yeah. Right? Imagine seeing <laughs> 40 years in the future yeah. Yeah. and you know, you know, next year is going to be this problem. Yeah. Yeah. It yeah. would never start. Yeah. But yeah. our ignorant and not being able not to know. see, not knowing is yeah, it's beneficial. Quite, it's, yeah, it's a blessing. Not knowing is a blessing, especially in politics. Mm. Not knowing what uh, what happens when you walk down the political path, political path is actually mm. quite beneficial because if you know, mm. I don't know if you'd want to do it. I mean, now that I know what I went through with politics, if you ask me, would you do that, that mm. go down that path? I said, yeah, I would. Because it's, it was a very character building mm. journey. Exactly that, right? It gave me the skills and the lessons to do what I'm doing today. Mm. If I had not been through that pitfalls, the whole right jungle of it, mm. it was like, it's like you were you know, in a minefield, trying to yeah, yeah, so I look through the bombs, mm. and uh, and I've stepped on a couple of landmines and have had definitely scars from it. But those scars, I love the Japanese thing, the Japanese bowl, the gold bowl. I forgot this, the, the what's called, but there's a concept in the Japanese culture whereby if you pieces piece together a broken bowl with gold. Is those line of gold of that bowl is what makes that bowl unique. And it's a beautiful concept. I love that Japanese concept. So, and I see my scars in the political arena and in life as well. And I, instead of just a, a black scar, but it's really some gold, yeah. you know, weaving into these broken pieces that has pulled it together. And that makes me who I am. Today. Yeah. Because I think when we look back at that time, we wish we didn't go through those problems. But now we, it's, it's, it makes our life so much more interesting. Yeah, right? I like, absolutely. You know, those challenges make, makes us who we are. And it's just developed. I think it develops us as a human being. Mm -hmm. And there's still more to come. Yeah, yeah. And so yeah, I know you've inspired me and you've inspired many people. And if someone's looking at you right now and go, wow, I want to be like you, you know, what would you say? And that would be like me. <laughs> I would say be you. I think that, you know, every one of us have got our individual uniqueness. And that's why I love storytelling because I want to find, because we all have that unique quality about us. Um, be the best you version of you. And whatever it is that you want to build or you want to create or you want to develop and you want to pursue, know that that journey there could is not a straight line. Mm. It, that could be, and if it, if it happens to be all these things being thrown at you along, that was meant to be. Mm, you know, and accept that mm. and embrace that. And as Steve Jobs 
famously say, connect the dot, the mm-hmm. dots at the end. Mm-hmm. Well, before we wrap up, I know I'm going to make you probably cry, I guess, but um, I know you lost your mum recently, and but I guess what are some of the things that you felt that she's left behind for you, the lessons, the things that you've you've been able to reflect on and go, now I've re- I've learned, I've reflected and I've, I've just realised all these things. She struggled coming here. I think I've learned that term. Sometimes in life you have to make a lot of personal sacrifices mm. and she made a lot of personal sacrifices. So I think that um, as a parent, I've learned she loved in a different way. Ooh. I've learned that, that her unspoken words, good cooking is a way of showing love. And I've learned even when she was alive that over the last few years that I had to stop judging, judging her, her way of living, her way of how she chose to live her life, what she did. She did because that's the best thing that she knew. You know, she didn't know any better. What I've learned is that I had to learn to love and be more affectionate to my family, sisters, and extended family, uh, that I had to learn to communicate, which is probably communication was something that I, I love because at the fact that we didn't communicate at all at home. The Vietnamese Asian culture, culture Asian yeah. culture, right? That's probably what I'm passionate about, communication, because I just love it so much because that was lacking. So, yes, yeah, so I, I think love comes in many forms. So And if you had to say something to her what would you think that I love her I, yeah oh I love you <laughs> well I better not let her cry anymore <laughs> let's go to school thank you so much she has to go to school for sharing with us I guess uh, today's episode is really different I wanted to bring someone that's not just from the business world but I think there's something we can gain and learn that whatever it is in life, whether it's a business, whether you're pursuing a political career or trying to get fit. It's like, it's not easy. It's never meant to be easy. It's meant for us to grow our character. It's meant for us to experience life so that we have these moments where we can feel gratitude, the humbleness. It's like, without all of that, there is no substance to us. And that's what I've realized about life. Just put in the hard work and stay focused with your vision. And at the end, doing it for beyond yourself, doing it for others is what makes life meaningful. So thank you for being here.